Welcome to the Books Read Thrive Podcast. I'm your host, Guy McPherson. Each week, we're going to be celebrating the books that help us grow, heal, and thrive, and talking to the incredible authors who write them. Books have the amazing power to change our lives. They've certainly changed mine, and I know they can change yours too. Thank you for being here, and get ready to change your life. All right. You ready to do it? Yes, sir. Okay. So five, four, three, two, and one. One. All right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. Very excited to have as my guest today, John Boyle. John, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Guy. You're welcome. So, John was born into a multi generational family of coal miners and was raised in the small Appalachian town of Kingwood, West Virginia. He's a graduate of the Harvard Business School in Cambridge, Mass. From the ages of 13 to 40, John worked in almost every capacity of his family's business, including 10 years as the company's president. As a civil engineer, he's constructed thousands of public infrastructure projects, energy projects, and natural gas facilities across 10 states up and down the East Coast. John is the author of Appalachian Kid, How Hope Changed Everything, a book about the importance of kindness and mentorship, overcoming adversity and addiction, finding faith and hope, and helping those in need. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So before we get going here, um, this is where I usually ask people to share where they're from originally and where they are currently. But obviously, I, I, in the in the bio, it says you're from uh, West Virginia. Oh, uh, are you where are you currently? I currently live in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, okay. I've been here about a year and a half. OK, yeah. so let's dive in here. Really interesting story. Um, how, how did this start for you? And when I say this, interpret that as you like. <laughs> okay. Well, um, this really started for me as a child. Uh, my earliest memories, Guy, I have um, been plagued with something that I didn't know what it was. And from my earliest memories, um, I knew something wasn't right. And so this started there. Uh, I grew up in a house that had violence. Um, That violence was the norm. And as a child, it was overwhelming. And so um, as I grew, uh, I had a great difficulty in school. And it was interpreted as laziness. It was interpreted as I was goofing off. It was interpreted that I didn't care. So uh, really growing up, I had a chip on my shoulder. And as I grew into a young man, um, my symptoms became more pronounced. Again, I didn't know how to explain them. I didn't know what the root cause was. I didn't know what to do about it. And, excuse and so, me, let me just interject. Excuse yeah. me. So this this uh, root cause, uh, you're referring to the violence in the house, dealing with that, the trauma yes. of that. Okay. Yes. And so, um, you know, I, I, I only had one experience growing up and – Uh, It really wasn't until I had my own children in my 30s um, that I began to decipher and interpret my own childhood in a different light, in a different lens. So um, in adulthood, in college and through uh, 36, 37 years old, um, I used alcohol to cover up those symptoms and to help me function. And it helped. I, I did well in my career. I, I, I succeeded. Um, but all along, there there was this parallel um, other half of the coin, if you will, um, that gave me extreme difficulty, um, primarily when no one was around. After work, when I was at home, uh, in the evenings when I was trying to rest or sleep, in my personal life on the weekends. And so as as I as I addressed my addiction to alcohol at 36 or 37, I learned I had PTSD. And then I could start reading books and, and learning about my disorder and finding ways to um, overcome the adversity I, I faced. You know, when you can define the problem, it's a lot easier to solve it. So uh, up until so, that point, yeah, had you ever... S- thought just what the hell is going on here oh yeah maybe something happened did you ever look back to your childhood and say yeah that violence just you know effed me up or what how did you deal with it as before prior to 36 
Well, a number of different ways. Um, at 26, I believe, I, I sought out my family physician first and I said, look, I, I have these things going on. And, and primarily I was going in and uh, I believe a therapist would call it a disguise presentation. It's it's not that I was purposefully disguising it. I was going in, guy, and I was saying, well, you know, I'm having extreme difficulty sleeping. And really, I've dealt with that from high school on. Uh, I would go in and say, well, I'm, I'm really stressed or I, I seem to be anxious, right? And and my doctor, at first my family physician, and then I would go see specialists. We never really had that discussion that that unpacked the full um, experience of my life. Mm -hmm. And so I was misdiagnosed for about 10 years. Uh, I was put on different medications, be it for insomnia, um, then an SSRI. Um, you know, this, this, it just dulled me. It, it didn't, it didn't really address what, what was going on. So, um, you know, I, I, my wife, I was married at, at, for the first time at 29, um, my wife felt that there was something wrong with me. And, and to answer your question, Guy, in a long, drawn-out way, um, there were all these precursors that make sense now. Uh, when my wife would come behind me and give me a kiss or a hug and I couldn't see it, I would flinch, right? And it makes so much sense now to say, yeah, that, that's a root cause of my mm -hmm. childhood. But but then it, it, I just didn't think they were related. I just thought I was a jumpy person, Um I didn't know anybody that had PTSD. The, the only people I thought who got it were soldiers. Right. Right. Totally understandable. Um, and, and in terms of being misdiagnosed, sad, unfortunate, but not surprising. I mean, it happens to it, so many very people. Common. Yeah. So um, what shifts for you such that you're like, okay, I need to get this drinking under control. I need to, you know, uh, really find out what the hell is going on and, yeah. and begin treatment and healing. What, what shifted for me, uh, guys. So I, um, was the CEO of my family's business and it was, uh, for West Virginia, uh, it was rather large. We had five or 600 employees and, um, the weight of that was consuming and that coupled with my disorder, I, I started having health problems and, um, I was as white as my shirt was. And I went into my doctor and I said, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I don't feel well. And so, um, and you were drinking during this time, during this time. And, and, and so I, um, I had some blood work done and I was malnourished. I was vitamin deficient and my, my liver wasn't functioning properly. And so my doctor explained to me that if I continued along this path, it wasn't going to be a good ending and it, it might be soon. And so I started trying to quit on my own and I couldn't like guy, not even close. Mm -hmm. And what really changed and gave me momentum. I was in a bar one night and it was after midnight and I was with a few friends and I was many drinks deep. And, you know, I started talking to one of my friends and my friend invited me to church. And from that point forward, Guy, um, I started, it wasn't like the, the you know, a, a snap of a finger or a lightning bolt out of the sky, but I started to gain purpose. I, I started to realize that life was about, life for me was about more than how I was living it at the time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, over time, really a few months, I gained the internal fortitude to you know, walk into the office and say, Hey, you know, I need to go to rehab and running a company of that size in a family business. Uh, that, that wasn't a fun day to go in. And <laughs> yeah, I can imagine tell my management team and my employees, but Hey, I'm not going to lie about it. I've got to address it. I've got to face it. You know, did they have an idea that something was going on Was something was, was troubling you was wrong with you? Um, that you were drinking a lot. I, I I think many of them suspected I was drinking a lot towards the uh, towards the end, the last couple of months before I quit. Uh, I was missing work. That was something that I didn't do. That was very out of character for me, and um, I, it became apparent. I had some siblings that worked in the business at the time, and you know they could see that quicker than maybe some of my uh, 
coworkers, you know, so they pointed it out and, and they did help me uh, come to the realization that I couldn't do it on my own. As a reminder, we're speaking with John Boyle. The book is called Appalachian Kid, How Hope Changed Everything. Um, so at, just as, as, a, as a kind of an aside here, before we get to the book, at what point uh, on the continuum here of this journey did you uh, go, go to Harvard Business School? So after, after I got sober. Um, after you got sober. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been sober 10 years. And um, I, I'm a graduate engineer, and I always wanted, you know, a business background and a business education, but I didn't realize until I went to rehab that my business would function with me gone. And so once I got help and got sober, I really focused on trying to better myself and do the things that I really couldn't do in my 20s and early 30s. And so, uh, you know, I tried to make my dreams a reality and I, I strove for the, <laughs> the hardest place I could apply to and, and, and I applied and got in. And I was shocked when that happened, to be honest with you. <laughs> and so was everybody who knew me. <laughs> Not that I was a terrible student, but I wasn't a straight A student by any means. By any means. Well, pretty amazing accomplishment. Um, how did the book come about? So originally the book came about, uh, it began or I started to hear people tell me you should write a book when I was at Harvard. Um, the program was called Owners and Presidents Management. And in that you have different uh, subjects like leadership and uh, controls and governance and finance and and those kind of classes. And one of the classes I took was a family business class by uh, a gentleman by the name of John Davis. John Davis uh, is now at MIT, but at the time he was at Harvard. And John, in, in our first family business class, started talking about why family businesses fail or why the majority of family businesses fail when they go from first to second generation, second to third, and so on. And, uh, you know, I, I felt that some of John's, um, maybe not assumptions, but his experience were a bit skewed. So I raised my hand and I started talking about my experience. And when, when you grow up in a home like I did, and then you work in the family business, you're triggered all the time, right? It's, it's difficult. Uh, so I shared my experience with my class and it monopolized it for an hour and a half. And when I got out of that class, you know, I had a few, um, classmates who were friends of mine who just emphatically said, you've got to write this book. And one of them, uh, Dr. Thomas Wiggleman from Munich, Germany, uh, would not let it go. And so over well, time- Hold on I, here. So yeah. uh, wh what was, what did you take uh, uh, concern with that John Davis was saying? You raise your hand. What, what caused that? Well, um, so John Davis was talking about in, in specifically why second and third generation um, family business members tend to um, not have the success that a founder does. Right. And so I, you're going back to 2017 or 18 guy. And <laughs> I don't remember the whole class per se, but much of it um, kind of centered around the founder um, or the the person in the uh, position of power in the older generation, kind of being this individual who has it all together, has a has a well thought out uh, purpose and strategy, and is passing a well oiled machine down to the next generation. And that isn't just it isn't always the case. I'm not finding fault with anybody who came before me in my family, but um, there were uh, there was a lot of divisiveness and there was uh, a lot of dysfunction. Um, within our family business and really within any family business. And that is not really talked about. And the mm -hmm. reason it's not talked about is, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for those family members to hear. It's hard to say. And you're, you're afraid if you come out and you speak the truth that you're not going to be invited to Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner. Right. right. Um, so it, it, it's a, it's a really weird um environment when you're navigating a business and a family what and that's you what the, i tried to get across to john what gave you the courage to do that 
to, to raise your hand and kind of speak the truth in a sense, your truth? Well, no one really knew me at Harvard. You know, I'm from West Virginia and and we've got these I've got these classmates from all over the world. And I just felt like like I should raise my hand and just tell my experience. I didn't think it would monopolize class. I didn't think it would end up being a book. And I certainly didn't think I'd be here talking to you about it, Guy. So let's kind of dial in on the book. Specifically, what did you want to do with the book? What what did you want to write? What did you write? So first, I wanted to help people. Uh, Guy, when I when I um when I learned I had PTSD and I and I got sober, um, I tried to buy every book I could on the subject. And there's some good books out there but there aren't a plethora of books. And so I had a hard time really reading these books and connecting the dots to how it relates to a guy like me. And so I felt like because the disorder is misdiagnosed often and there's difficulties with disguise presentations and everything else, I felt that if I wrote a memoir about my life and I talked about the symptoms I had at the different ages and what difficulties I was dealing with, that it might help someone who hasn't been diagnosed, read it and say, wow, I have this too. Right. And so that was really my purpose of of writing it. I'm sorry, I forget the other question you asked me. Well, no, it was just, you know, what did you write? What did you want to write? What was the impetus for the book? Yeah. The So what I wanted to write was I wanted to write a book that helped people, but it also told my journey and how I ended up telling my story. Um, A friend of mine has a charity called Building Hope and it's centered in West Virginia. Um, He's a fellow businessman, his name's Mark Urso. And he's been so successful that he received the FBI director's award for um, an outstanding charity. I forget the exact term Mm -hmm. um, of the award, but but it's well recognized and it's it's really it's a program that replaces bullying with empathy. It teaches empathy and understanding your fellow students um, plight. Right. Understanding where they're coming from so that you're not piling on and um, you're being understanding and empathetic and not hurtful. So I volunteered at my hometown high school and did this program with freshmen back in. 2018. And when I was driving up to my hometown from where I lived in Morgantown, um, you know, I thought it was going to go one way. And so I spent the day with these freshmen and it it changed the lenses that I saw my own life. And coming home, I, I I looked at my life in a completely different perspective. It was really the first time I had interacted with young people who had three of the four in my breakout group I believe had the same disorder I did, at least displayed some of the similar symptoms. Um, the area in West Virginia I'm from, Guy, is, is it's impoverished. It's hit hard and it's not very hopeful. And um, there isn't a lot of employment options there. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite sad what my mm-hmm. community has devolved to. So, um, Really, I wrote about my disorder in how I shared it with these freshmen that day. And I tell this, how my life changed. That sounds like a really powerful experience. What what can you take us there a little bit further? I mean, what what did you see when you were talking to these kids? How did it uh, sh- shift your lens in a sense? Okay, yeah. So, um So I'm in a breakout session with four 13-year-old freshmen in in my hometown high school, and we start talking about how we grew up. And really, at first, I didn't talk about myself. I was just a moderator, a facilitator. And so um, as these kids told their stories, you know, each one was different, but three of the four, um, one of them was a kid whose stepfather just you know, was, was very abusive. And, you know, he, uh, witnessed his mom just being, um, you know, the the victim of violence from her step, from her, uh, husband, his stepfather. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the next one up, um, you know, was unfortunately a father again. And the third was a set of parents. Um, it wasn't violence on this one. It was more substance abuse mm -hmm. and the parents were incarcerated, right? And the grandparents were, um, taking care of this young lady. And, you know, just as they told their story, a guy at one point, I had to excuse myself from my small group. I went out um, into the concourse. I went in the men's bathroom and I found the first stall and I punched it as hard as I could. Oh, man. I, it, it, it angered me to no end to hear of children being mistreated. And so I, I'm honest in this, right? This is something that we don't talk about much as a society. Right. It's not. It's something you talk about when you're a victim of it or your experience has been violence um, or childhood mistreatment or abuse. And you're trying to, you know, uh, free yourself from the talons of it. This is not something that just is brought up at a dinner table. At least that's not by, been my experience. Right. So when I'm there and when I'm in a circle with these high school kids, um, you know, I can't get away from it. And it's like, well, you know, at a certain point in that day, my brain switched to um, from myself and, and how it was triggering to me to how do I make a difference? What do I share about my story that can make a difference with these young people? And in the afternoon session, I absolutely had an opportunity to do that. And uh, it, it makes for a wonderful story and it's a story and, of, and is that what's in the book? Yes, sir. Wow. Memoir along with, um, chapter there's 12 chapters in the book. Chapter 11 is the longest chapter by far. And that is my, most of my interaction with these high school students and me sharing my story with them in a way that it, it was, uh, it added value to their lives. To what degree, John, um, were you scared, quite frankly, to stand up and say, you know, I have PTSD or I'm a man, deal, you know, dealing with this? Mm -hmm. You know, we often hear through our culture and society that, uh, you know, it's hard for men to stand up and say, I've been uh, the experience of this, I've been a victim, you know, how, how, what's your experience been like that? My experience has been guy that I have been very hesitant and been very hesitant to speak about it to anyone for years. Uh, even my close friends, my very close friends. Um, I've been honest to my, my spouse. I, I've been remarried for five years or so. Um, I've been, uh, forthcoming with a few close friends, but really other than that, until I started writing the book guy, I didn't tell anyone. I didn't want to tell my family. I didn't want to tell my business partners, uh, because what about I, your siblings, um, no, no, not really. Um, after the book guy, I told them that I wrote it and told them that I had this and, and, um, I let them see it before I published it. Um, my fear has always been for my professional life and the way that I feed my family. Um, you know, I, I've worried uh, before it's published. Obviously, I came to terms with it or I wouldn't have published it. I worried a good bit before it was published that I would be seen as someone who's crazy. And it's just not the case. Uh, you know, when 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 you look at uh, some of the best books out there, I, I think the uh, the the Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk is a, is a really good book and. You know, he's got a quote in there that says that uh, um, unlike other forms of psychological disorders, the key component in trauma is reality. I just simply have a different experience in my childhood than other people do. And that that's the difference. Right. But it took me a long time to come to that realization. Uh, I I'm, I'm, keep going back to that image of you with those high school kids and hearing their story and sharing your own. I mean, it just seems like such a powerful image. Um, I mean, I think it's pretty amazing that those kids had that space to share what they did. Yeah. Right. Cause this is, as you said, so astutely, we don't talk about this. So 
were you, you said when you were growing up, you know, that that was normal for you, that, that type of violence. Was it, was. it something that you, that many people in that environment, in in your surrounding, in your neighborhood, was that just the way it was? Was this, was this specific to your home? Um, I would say it's, it's common in my community. I don't know that it's common to be talked about. Um, you know, it, it's, it's something that happens behind closed doors. Right. And, and one of the things about it is, you know, it, it may not start, um, as being, uh, a scenario where, it's a parent and a child and it's devolving to violence. Sometimes it can just be a family argument and you're just shrapnel. Right. Mm. Um, I experienced it on a regular basis on a regular basis. My holidays were that way. Our vacations were that day or, or that were that way. Um, this is something that occurred all the time. Maybe not every day, but certainly every month and probably every week. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it, it, at, at a certain point, at a certain age, it became overwhelming and my health devolved considerably. Can you talk about a few of the things that you've done that's helped you heal? Mm. Yes. Um, there have been a few things that have helped me heal. Um, for one, Quitting alcohol, having no substance abuse, um, ways to numb or use uh, as a crutch. Uh, the second thing that I found that was helpful was EMDR. And I, I forget exactly what the acronym stands for, but it was quite helpful in helping me sleep. Um, the third thing, and probably, uh, not probably, by far the most impactful was um, becoming spiritual, uh, having a faith life, um, finding a way to offload what happened and hit a reset button mm. and trying to move forward um, and have that not be your identity, even though, guy, that you're triggered daily. I am triggered every day. There's there's not one day of the week, not one month of the year that that I'm not dealing with this disorder. It is, it is that um, consuming. So as we kind of wind down here, who would you say the book is for? Well, I tried to write the book for a myriad of people. I tried to write it for the person in the driver's seat who's like me. I also tried to write it for the people around that person in the driver's seat so they could understand. And Third, I wrote the book to give people hope um, that these stories don't have to end in prison sentence. They don't have to end in a grave, right? They don't have to end in dysfunction and, and you know, passing your abuse on down the line. Um, there can be a happy ending. It's not that every facet of my life is happy, guy, but... There are many parts of my life that have improved by addressing and moving forward despite what's wrong with me, right? So uh, I believe that story um, lends a great opportunity for people to listen to it, to read it, and to, I don't know if they'll be inspired by it, but they'll certainly see the... Um, the fruits of overcoming uh, adversity and having resilience in the face of something that's awful. Well, that and sounds pretty damn face, inspiring to me. <laughs> yeah. Whatever they face, I, I just want them to, to, to know what worked for me and whether they apply it to themselves or not, at least they know that that option is there. Right. Those, those, those kids, were they boys that you were talking to in that group? Two boys, two girls, two boys, two girls, two boys, two uh, girls. What did you want to give them? What did you want? What did you want to infuse into that group when you were talking to them? Mm. 
That's a really good question. Um, my first answer is hope, right? But 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 peeling back the layers a bit, um, one of the things that one of the boys told me in an early morning session or the early morning session was um, that God's not real, that he plays favorites, right? And guy, that is something that I, I grew up Catholic. I'm not Catholic anymore. Uh, but that is something that I believed as a young man. And um, you feel like an outsider looking in almost that you're not good enough. Right. And so what I shared with these young people and, and what I share in my book is that, you know, that God is real and he does love you and there is hope. And I explained the differences of hope and how our wor world sees it and how faith sees it. And I hope their takeaway was they knew the difference. Mm -hmm. That there is hope that that you can rise above adversity and be something and not be defined by what happened to you. That's awesome. Um, perfect way to stop here. Uh, John, what is the best way for people to reach out? Uh, learn more about you and what you're doing. Okay. So the best way to learn uh, more about me is to go to my website. It is AppalachianKid.com. And uh, there's a link to Amazon to buy my book. I have an audio book coming out. Uh, you can buy it paper copy or hardback. I have an audio book coming out in a few weeks. Um, if uh, there's also a, a a link there to my um, my email, and that's John at AppalachianKid.com. Okay. We'll have all those linked up here at the show notes page at the TrumpetTempestPodcast.com. John, come on, man. So inspiring. My gosh. Love to have you back at a later date. Yeah. But, uh, really appreciate uh, you doing it. I mean, just come on. Courage. Yes. Fight. Jesus. Oh, amazing. Yes. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Appreciate you. it. I've had so many uh, inspiring emails from people and just feedback, um, you know, of, of, of just how it moved them. Or, you know, I, I, I had a, um, gosh, I had a, a guy who's a Marine, a U.S. Marine and a veteran, and he gave it to his two boys. And um, he just told him, this is a once in a lifetime book. Wow. There's a lot of good life lessons in this and you boys need to read it. And don't throw it away. Don't give it away. You guys right. keep it right. Um, other other examples, um, you know, people have reached out and, and just said, hey, thank you for telling your story. I can't tell mine, but I'm glad you told yours. Mm. Thanks for standing up for us. Right. Wow. Um, I just want to help people, guy. That's all I'm interested in. I just I, I wrote a book to help people and I just wanted to get out there and, and just share my story. And well, thank you. You for helping me do that. Oh, well, you're welcome. Um, I'm looking forward to getting this out there. Yeah. Um, all right, sir. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. And if you're interested to learn more about what I do, head on over to the Books Read Thrive Podcast.com. That's the Books Read Thrive Podcast.com. Take care.